So it is great, and I'm excited to uh, be with you guys. So we're going to be talking about the most neglected mission field and why I believe that's your workplace. And this goes right along with what Derek said. Part of me, while I was sitting and listening to him, I'm like, I think we just need to give him the second 30 minutes and he can just uh, keep going. And uh, that would be great. So this is a topic that I'm very passionate about, uh, very much like Derek was sharing, because this is something over the last few years I've been seeing as very vital. And especially since post-pandemic, Christians are in a very unique situation in the workplace where some of us have had to be remote workers. Some of us are still in our office setting. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of new trainings. I know there was references to uh, DEI in the, the prior session and things like that. So definitely there's some things we as Christians have to look at when we are in our workplace and our job setting. Derek did an absolutely fantastic job covering a lot of the, the concerns and using Daniel as an example. I've, I myself, I've seen that and, and read and studied that in, in much the same way. So those are perfect examples. So for me, if you read my bio that's on the thing, um, I am an HRIS data specialist with a community college. I am in both an educational institute and within human resources. So a lot of training is, and things that I see right, right on par with, with the topic of the session that I've got here, Derek's session, and so on. And Derek mentioned it, and I, I'm the same way. Nothing that I say represents the organization I work for or anything like that whatsoever, purely my opinion. And I've seen both that be good and bad for other people. But for me, I'm thankful that God has given me the opportunity to speak and share uh, the way I, I do have the freedom to at this time. And I do want to get this going here. There we go. All right. So a little bit about me. If you read the bio, you saw some of it. But I am very much a speaker, uh, not so much a, a presentation designer, so I, I do leave a little bit to be desired here. But what you see on screen is I'm presenting in front of HR professionals, I'm speaking at churches, I'm doing trainings at colleges and other locations, as well as social media content, YouTube videos, that kind of thing. I'm all over the place speaking in front of a lot of different people and in front of a lot of different people. I am beyond thankful that I have that opportunity to do so. My passion is leadership, personal development, but there's definitely a Christian element in that because the greatest leadership example we have is Jesus. And I believe that one of the greatest examples or models of leadership can be seen in the model of discipleship. And so there's parallels throughout the entire Bible that we can reference and look at. But I want to briefly cover what I'm going to talk about here in this session is what does it mean to be a missionary? And I'll tell you, it's not what you think. A lot of us, we don't exactly have uh, the right definition, if, if in my opinion, but I don't think we do. Then what mission fields are you active in? There's an impact that you can have as a professional where you work that is different than what a pastor or your pastor can even have. And then what kind of tools and positions that God has given you. So we're going to cover these as we go through. So I want to give you the official definition here of a missionary. According to you know, our famous Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it's a person undertaking a mission and especially a religious mission. So when we look at this definition, that seems fairly straightforward. Most of us, when we think of a missionary, we think of somebody that God has maybe called to a specific mission field, a, a specific people group, a specific country. They're going out and to another place. They may have a church that sends them. They may raise donations. They may get supporters, and they are going and reaching out to other people. We in the United States, we are the most sending country of missionaries abroad. And most often when we hear that term missionary, that's where our mind goes first. We think of it's someone that goes to another country. It's someone that goes out to another people group. 
It's somebody that learns another language and goes somewhere else. There's so many things that we see, and that's what we think of when we hear missionary. But I think of this verse, Matthew 28, and verses 19, and the first part of verse 20 is, is typically what I reference and read for this, is Jesus is commanding, and he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Most people, when they read this, the Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples, teach them. We focus in on this make disciples of all nations. We focus on that nations, and we think of going abroad. We think of going out into the world. And there's many of us, we are professionals. Maybe we get to go on a mission trip with our church. Maybe we do it on our own. Uh, myself, my wife, our church, we just recently took a trip to Honduras. That was actually one of the pictures of me speaking that was on one of those prior slides. I was able to speak in front of a group of church leaders while in Honduras. That was great. I was able to go on a mission trip. But does that really make me a missionary if I go and do one thing, one time, and that's it? By a lot of people's definition, yeah, that's mission work. That's a missionary action. I went abroad. I went to another country. But here's the thing. When we get beyond the all nations part of this, the key is we're commanded to make disciples. And this is more of what I want to focus in on for a moment, is when you consider what discipleship is and what the model of discipleship was, the disciples of Jesus, they knew exactly what this was. They understood this concept. For us, this word disciple, we hear it. Maybe you've had discipleship training in your church, whatever that might look like. But for them, it was the model of a rabbi to their student. It was somebody who would follow the rabbi. They would learn from the rabbi. They would be with the rabbi all the time. This teacher that they had, they would learn everything they could to be just like that one so that when that rabbi would move on, they would pass away, they would move to somewhere else, the student could then assume that role and continue on the work. So when you think of that in context of me, as an example, going on a mission trip one time, speaking to a group of people, doing a handful of good things over seven, eight, nine, ten days, that was a mission trip. You did a lot of good. But as far as the command to go and make disciples, it's really hard unless you are a full-time missionary going and doing. But if we have, all of us have this command to go and make disciples, what does that mean for us? If we can't go and be abroad, or maybe God's not called you into full-time ministry. Maybe God's not called you to go to Africa or South America or Asia or wherever it might be. What, what about us here at, at home? We have families and lives and professional careers. What, what does this command to make disciples look like for us? This is where it comes into play for your everyday, your workplace. So let's think about what discipleship involves. So when you think about discipleship and what I described to you, comment in the chat and let me know what are some things that you think are important when it comes to discipleship. Any thoughts or ideas here? Your story, that's definitely a good one. Now I'll, I'll touch on that just a little bit here. Anybody else got something? I'm going to show a few things, but definitely want to give the opportunity. But your story plays a vital role in this for sure. Showing care and concern for those entrusted to your leadership. Very good. I love the use of leadership. I'm, I'm a leadership trainer, so you're hitting my, my heartstrings there. Uh, living your faith as well as telling. So this is, is very interesting. So when we think about what discipleship involves, mentoring, yes, absolutely, being open. 
So a lot of what you guys are saying and a lot of what you're typing in chat falls right in line with this first point that I got in discipleship. It starts with relationships. Because when you think of the model of a teacher to a student or a, a rabbi to their disciple, their follower, they were together. They were building a relationship. They were learning about each other. They were sharing meals together. They were having conversations and engaging with one another. So when you think about that opportunity to go and make disciples of other people, you've got to consider who are you around? Who are you having conversations with? Who are you building that connection to? Who do you have common interest with? What kind of topics are you discussing? Are you sharing meals with certain people? For a lot of us, we're around coworkers about as much as anybody. If you work a nine to five, eight to five type of job somewhere in those hours, there's a large chunk of your day. And for many people, many professionals, they are around people at their job and their work more than they are their own family which I don't always agree with that. I fully believe work-life balance, and that's something I stress. But that's a, a reality of corporate America. There are a lot of professionals there around coworkers, a lot. And they have a good, strong relationship and rapport with those coworkers that they're around. The next thing is, what are the regular interactions and, and common interests? I already touched on this, but think again. If you're around your coworkers a lot, hours a day, whether that's cubicles or side by side in offices and passing, there's a lot of conversations. I know for me and my coworkers and past jobs and current jobs, how was your weekend? You know, what, you know, how's your pets been doing? Or how's your wife? How's your kids? Do you do anything fun this weekend? There's so many different casual interactions and conversations where I can tell you about the likes and some of the interests and activities that my coworkers do. I can tell you about some that they enjoy hiking, I can tell you which ones go to church and which ones do not just from conversations. I can tell you about which ones have families and kids and roughly the age of the kids. I may not remember the exact age specifically, but roughly are they toddlers? Are they more grown? Are they teenagers? You hear and you pick up on these conversations and you learn. And I like what I see uh, there in the chat, the term work spouse. So I will touch on that. I actually had a, a manager that previously made the comment that he looked for people to hire to his team because essentially he was going to be married to them because of how much time he was going to be spending with them. And so it was that you're going to be there. You're going to be stuck with them. And that's the way he viewed it is if I'm going to spend eight hours a day with you, then I'm going to want to like you and get along with you. So. I've definitely seen that term as well. But here's the thing with discipleship. This is where it goes to living your faith, telling your faith, but also uh, the idea of your story. Discipleship is not a course. It's not a class. It's not really a title. It's not something that you can just do one time and that's it. Discipleship is the life you live. A life of discipleship is the rabbi teaching the follower and then the follower assuming that role, but then also sharing with someone else. It's that continuation and the concept of leadership. If you've ever studied it or looked at it, you hear legacy of leadership or reproducing leaders. It's that idea of a leader goes, they learn and they grow. They bring others up with them and they pass on what they know. And then by doing that, others become leaders. And then those leaders can go and reproduce more leaders and so on. And I always reference the example here that we in, in America, we, we get this one thing in our churches mixed up a little bit where we focus on adding people to our church and the attendance numbers. I know even in smaller churches, it's do we have how many people are on the attendance sign and, and how many people are here? But. I heard the numbers in talking to a pastor that was very passionate about discipleship, and he shared this, is that if you add 20 people to your church every single week for 20 years, you will add somewhere a little over 20,000 people to a church in those 20 years. That's pretty large mega church, if we're being honest. That's a very large crowd of people. But if you disciple one person, and you teach them about what it is to live for Christ, 
what it is to model and live and serve faithfully in their life as they are going about their daily routine, their life, their work career, all of those things. And you only disciple one person for one year. But then in that second year, you and that other person can then take on a new disciple or you reach out and, and build that relationship with another person. And then that cycle continues where the next year now there's four people. As it builds, by the time you get to that 20 year mark, discipling one person per year, there is over one million people that are impacted. That's more than that 20,000. One over one million people. I stress this because that goes beyond growing a church or growing a community or growing a small group. When you get to a million or millions of people, you're talking about communities and states and cities, even countries. You're talking about a major impact that you can have just in one person. But I'll take it a step further because we're talking about your workplace. What if that one person is somebody that God opens the door and gives you the opportunity to reach out to at your workplace? And it may be that it starts with you. The next year there's two. The next year there's four. What happens if the entire corporate culture changes because God puts somebody on your heart to reach out to and disciple, mentor, reach out to, and you were able to reach that one person? You may not impact the entire company all at once, especially if you're in a large organization. But what if you have the opportunity to impact just one, that first person? If God gives you that opportunity, it's important that we recognize that and take advantage of that. So when we think of missionary, here's my definition. This is more of how I look at it. It's a person living a life on mission for God, making disciples as they are going in the routine, everyday life. And I think that's important. David added in, in the comment, and I see that, that we often don't see that impact. We don't see the impact of the compounding effect. We often just see what is right in front of us. But that's the cool thing with discipleship. And it's one reason both in leadership and discipleship, I'm passionate about it because I may not fully ever see the impact that my life has. I may not know the number of people that hear or take a lesson from me or are impacted. I talked when I was getting started, I do content creation. I'm in the process of writing a book. There are hundreds of people that have seen things that I've posted online. Very few of them I actually know. Could it impact their life? It's very possible. I may not ever know. But I have to be faithful that what I'm doing is helping people, growing people, encouraging people, challenging people. I know even here on this conference, I don't think any of you have ever met me before, never interacted with you. But yet I've got the opportunity to speak to you and tell you something. But I also don't know if I will ever see or interact with you again. This may be the only time that you guys ever hear Nick speak. So if I can leave you with something that goes and makes an impact that you can carry on, that's an impact I don't see, but it still has a, an impact. It matters. Even little things matter. And I'll talk more about that in, in just a moment as well. So I want you to take just a moment. I don't know if you have something you want to write in front of you, or maybe you want to type it in chat, but write down some ideas of where you can make disciples. Where can you have an impact, even if it is just one person's life? Think about what that is. And if you're open to share and want to share, type it in in chat. Type, uh, let me know, where do you think you have an impact? What is your mission field? See uh, if anybody shares anything here, but I do want to give you a moment. So definitely, definitely write, write down if you've got anything. So nonprofit association. I see the point by David that these sessions will even be shared. So that goes for all any speakers that are here, have presented, will be presenting, and even myself. We even don't know what, what the potential impact is long term. 
I love that. You work for a discipleship organization. This falls right in line. I love that. Grocery store, family, work, friends. It's great. Society in general, absolutely. Friends of your children, that's that's a great example. Students at Liberty, that's a great one. Family, coworkers, youth, volunteer for, church, kids, anywhere, anytime, absolutely. So here I'll share with you just a, a couple examples from me and also a couple examples from a friend and then also from my wife. I've got some personal examples that I can share. So for me, doing a lot of leadership training, I have the opportunity to speak in front of a, a fairly diverse audience. So I've been able to present in many different places and I'm getting the opportunity to present in more. So to give you an idea, I'm currently in, in talks of speaking to local high school students, talk about leadership. While that may not be a Christian focused or a discipleship focus, they still get important life lessons that do tie into biblical concepts and if there's an opportunity for me to tie in a biblical concept or a topic in a tactful way, because I have to be respectful to organizations, their policies, those types of things, I'm able to do that. But then there's also that connection to me where if somebody goes and looks up my social medias, they'll see that I'm open about my faith and I share things from the Bible. They may go and find the book that I'm currently writing where when that's published, it's gonna have scriptures in it and there's gonna be spiritual conversations and those types of topics. That's gonna to be in there. So there's things where there's those subtle connections, but they can have an impact. Even in my current position, I'm actually starting to do some professional development for us. And here's an example that came from one of our recent sessions where we're studying a John Maxwell book. If you know him, he's former pastor, came out of the Wesleyan church, but he shares sometimes scriptures or a biblical concept in a book. And while we were going through that, one of the participants referenced one of the spiritual concepts and took a moment and there was a brief spiritual conversation that occurred in the middle of a professional development that's supposed to have no spiritual religious implications whatsoever, but yet it occurred naturally because of my willingness to facilitate, but God bringing that out in another person through the material we were studying. So while it wasn't religious focused, it still gave that opportunity and it was still done in a way that that was acceptable. But then here's another example. I was part of a non-denominational focused small group. They were multiple churches, different denominations, but it was all focused on discipleship, having a Bible study, being a fellow group of believers. And all of us were in the age range of 30 and under, really. There was very few of us or very few people in the group over 30. So all these young people would come together just to study the Bible, pray together and learn about discipleship. We're able to encourage, but then to go out and reach other people, invite friends, build that community. For my wife, she worked in retail for a while. And so that's an example where she was able to interact and had these regular conversations that would just naturally come up. And this was even an employer, they did discourage any kind of religious conversations. But yet when the coworker would ask my wife her opinion on something or a viewpoint on something, she had to be honest. She had to be truthful and stand her ground and share what she believed. When she did that, that became a mission field for her. She was able to witness and to share truth from the Bible with other people. I have another friend, he works for a medium-sized corporation he takes his lunch break about once every couple weeks, has a Bible study, completely voluntary. He invites people, tells them about it. If they want to come, they can. Sometimes he may only have a few people. I've seen people in management, upper management. He said he's got interest from a lot of different people where just from the invite, out of a courtesy, they're willing to come. And they may come to one session, but they'll hear him reading some scripture, praying together. It's an impact that he has, and it's voluntary during a work lunch break. So those are all options. So when we think about going through your home and your family, that's probably the biggest one, because this is your future generations. These are the people that are closest to you. They're the people you can impact the most. There's new young believers. 
those that are maybe recently have come to know Christ, you can reach out to them, encourage them, help them, teach them. Those are people you can help. There's your community, people you're around, even go into the grocery store. If God lays it on your heart to interact with somebody, maybe you have the opportunity to talk to them. It may just be a simple word of encouragement, and that plays a difference in some people's lives. But then what about your workplace? Because there is that interaction where you are with them for hours every single day, multiple days a week. And those are people we interact with. We build the relationships. We've already got interests, some common knowledge between us. There's already that connection. Sometimes that door is already open. We just focus in on it's a work relationship and it's only got to be work and strictly work and we got to get the job done. But you can let your work speak to your belief in Christ. That's already been said in the last couple of sessions that your work is a testimony of your faith in God. And you can use that to also allow people to impact. So God has placed you where you are for a reason. That's been said in the last two sessions. For such a time as this, God has placed you where you are. And I, none of us speakers, as far as I know, have talked to each other and planned anything, but you could very well be the missionary in your company. You could be the person that God has put in that company for such a time as this to have the impact for the kingdom. But I want to stress that many non-believers, people that are not currently Christians, they're not simply just going to walk into church. There are some people, maybe they're, they're curious, God's working on them, and maybe they do come visit. The vast majority will never walk into the doors of a church, which is why the everyday Christian in their work, in their life, in their community has the most impact to reach out and connect with people. Pastors, and I'm not meaning this in a negative context if there are people who are pastors here on this, but I heard this actually in an entrepreneur business uh, Christian setting, but they said that there's a lot of times pastors are wrapped up in the ministry and the church and volunteers and sermons and counseling, and they're wrapped up in this ministry-like bubble that they don't really have the ability to connect with working professionals. If you put a pastor with somebody that works in accounting and say, hey, find common interest, might be difficult. But if you work in accounting and you've got a coworker that works in accounting, you've already got some commonality there. You're able to connect. You have the opportunity to reach even beyond what your pastor can. You are the person with the relationship, the common ground, the connection, the ability to impact people where you are as you're going day to day. So when we talk about tools, I'm trying to go a little quick because I'm running out of time and I want to get through these last few things and read one last thing to you here at the end. Start with a relationship. That is the most important thing because if you're trying to do a, a track or gimmick or invite people with very little relationship, you know, a new person starts at your job day one, you walk up, hey, I'm a Christian. Will you come visit my church? That, that's, that's not going to go well. You're going to come off as one of those crazy religious people. But if you have that relationship and they trust you, you have that rapport already built, then when maybe there's an event at your church, hey, we're having this dinner, hey, we're having this event, this play, this uh, music, whatever it is, you can invite them and they can come in and maybe it's a soft introduction to your church and get them to come in. So a question like the example of my friend that I shared, can you maybe start a lunchtime Bible study? Something simple. You do it voluntary. It's not technically on company time. Maybe it's just a study or a prayer time between you and one other person. Maybe it's a fellow Christian. You meet, you study the Bible once every couple weeks, 30 minutes, something simple. And then maybe there's somebody else that's curious what you're doing and you're able to invite them. Something simple. But don't be ashamed of your faith. Even the smallest of comments matter. Even small interactions, small comments, passing conversations, they do matter. One thing for me, some of those small comments when people ask, what do I do over the weekend? I'll share, oh, I was at church Sunday. We had this going on. Or, oh, we had this event at church. Or, oh, we had VBS this past week and, and these types of things happened. Small conversations, small points doesn't come off as crazy religious. It's just talking about my weekend, my past week. But those are little ways that you can have that opportunity and to go. You say, but Nick, what if my company doesn't want a Bible study group? And I will say, go back and listen to Derek's session. He covered that really well. But 
coming from an HR perspective, review the HR policies. Consider what you're allowed to do, maybe what you're not allowed to do. It may be that you're not allowed to do it on company property, but can you go outside, have a 30 minute Bible study outside? Maybe it's you do it on a lunch break. Maybe there's an opportunity, depending on the organization, you can request permission. So there's that opportunity, use your lunch break. But most importantly, your work and what you do day in and day out should reflect your relationship with Christ. People should be able to look and say, you know, Nick has something different about him. You know, David, they have something different about him. Derek, there's something different about him. I want to know what he's got, what makes him so committed to what he does. And that is that relationship in Christ. So some final thoughts for you guys. And I've got one last thing to read to you is be intentional and look for an opportunity to make disciples as you're going. You're an everyday missionary and your workplace is a mission field. So I submitted this topic idea and was planning uh, this a pretty good ways back. And I was already thinking about what I was going to say, what I was going to share. And while we were on our, our mission trip, and my wife doesn't know I'm, I'm doing this, but she actually, uh, part of our thing is we had to have a devotional every night. And this was ended up being her devotional that God gave her. I want to share it with you because I've challenged her to write these down and share them with people, trying to encourage her, put them in a book and, and write some devotionals, things like that, because it's so impactful. But I want to share this with you, and this will be the final thing that I share. But she wrote and says that, and she references Matthew 28, 18 through 20, but Jesus says to go. And since that time that Jesus said go, we have gone. The church has sent missionaries all over the world, and many lives have been changed because of their love for Jesus and their willingness to spread the word of God. My concern is that many have become content to allow other people to go into other countries and be missionaries while they may not live a mission-minded lifestyle at home. In the U.S., we're quick to praise a missionary to another country, but can forget the everyday missionaries around us. She gives that definition of missionary, that it's a person undertaking a mission. David in 1 Samuel 17 asked if there was a cause after hearing Goliath, the Philistine, defy God. But we have a cause today. We can tell others about Jesus Christ so that they can receive his sacrifice as their own, his salvation and the Holy Spirit. We can give them hope for tomorrow through Christ. When we go on mission trips to another country, everything is intentional. We're not there to waste time or vacation. It isn't about us. It's beautiful and powerful. The drive that we have there, we can have here at home. We are called to go to our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers the way that we do that is by living intentionally and taking action. On a mission trip, we are looking for opportunities to help others. We are ready to talk about the Bible. We are ready to answer questions, probably with a translator, in order to get Jesus's message across. Those are the very things we can do at home. Many of us, we, we already do that. But on a mission trip, we are sacrificing our time and comfort to be there. It's a sacrifice, but when we come back home, life may go back to normal. But that time spent as a missionary shouldn't be allowed to fall away with our daily routines. People will praise us for going to another country as if that is the only way to be a missionary, but it isn't. Every day is a mission. We can have even more impact in our own country where we speak the language and we know the culture than a place where we don't. Our lives are not our own, according to 1 Corinthians 6.19. Ephesians uh, 3.7 says, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. So what is your mission? We can be intentional with our lives and take action on those intentions. Notice I say intentional and not planned out because plans change, but our mission should always be to share the message of Jesus Christ. You are the everyday missionary. Your workplace is a mission field. Your family is a mission field. Your community is a mission field. Every day we should strive to be on mission because that's what God has called us to do, to make disciples as we're going. So if you have any questions uh, for me, any thoughts, feel free to put those in chat. If you would rather send those to me, 
uh, you can always uh, scan the QR code that goes to my link tree. There's going to be the link there to my link tree as well or my email. Feel free to send me anything, any comments, questions. Um, also, just as a side note, if you see me or uh, me and my wife will be at homecoming. So if anybody is at homecoming, you see us definitely come by, say hey. And uh, if you like that devotional, uh, please feel free to, to send a comment as well, and I'll pass that along to my wife. So thank you. It's been a, a pleasure uh, presenting and speaking with you, and this has been a great conference so far. Just the energy of your presentation is, is just a blessing as well. So thank you for that.